Leben. Hi, I'm Pastor Paul Marzan. And this week I'm down in Colombia with some of our other church leaders and we're growing hearts closer to God. We're growing more leaders so they can lead more churches. And so please keep us in your prayers as we're in mission down there for the next two weeks. Our scripture reading today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is a fantastic passage, so turn to your Bibles at this time. It says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And here's the reason why. So that the servant of God may be equipped for every good work. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I just pray for your anointing this day on our various campus pastors who are preaching this day, that they may deliver your word according to your word, just as you said. It is all God-breathed. So bless them as they deliver the message this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroads Church, one of the many. And Pastor Paul is absent today. As you can see, um, he's in Columbia doing wonderful things with church planners there. And uh, as he usually does when he is gone, he asks me to preach. Um, and so I usually do something that uh, I don't always have his permission to do until like the night before. So here we go. Uh, I made a giant whiteboard. Um, all you need to do, you know, all you need to have in order to make one of these eight-foot whiteboards is uh, $34 and a father-in-law. And you, yourself, can have a giant whiteboard. Um, I'm also notorious for not putting notes in the note section, fill in the blanks, and I get a hard time for it. And so if, uh, if you, one of your things you're going to write today is, Jeremiah didn't have any notes for me to fill in, um, you don't have to do it today, all right? Use that time to write something else. But I did provide you with this. If you take out your note section and you hold it upright like this, and then you take it and you turn it like this, you have yourself a miniature 8 by 4 whiteboard, all right? You can write down everything that I say in a square right there, or that I write down on the board. Um, what, what year is it? 2013, right? Okay, that's important for lots of reasons, but for our board it's important. Um, today we're going to talk about, we're in the middle of a series talking about our core values at Crossroads. And our core values, there's nine of them, and today we're talking about joy. Now, when you think about joy, you think like, I don't know, like little puppies running through a field, right? You think about just happiness. This is great. Joy is wonderful. Joy to the world that starts out with Jeremiah is a bullfrog, right? You know that song? Um, a really good song. Um, I used to cry when people would sing it to me, but that's for another day, for another day. Uh, joy. Now, I want to show you a picture of when I think of joy, and maybe you think of this. This is what comes to your mind, something like this. This is not Joy. This is my wife, Megan. And uh, this is the day we got married. We don't just stand there and cry next to each other all the time. This is the day we got married. And um, this is what Joy looks like. At least when I first thought of the word Joy, this is what I thought of. And I, didn't, I, and I don't mean that getting married to me is Joy. Like, that's not what I mean. But uh, my face is probably doing the same thing as hers at this point. Um, and her face is much more pleasant to look at than mine. So that is why you get to see this. Uh, but at Crossroads, we define joy a little differently. And if you read our core value, you know that it's not what you would necessarily expect. Now, here's how we, here's, what, here's the phrase that goes with the core value, joy. To experience joy as a product of the Holy Spirit when we study God's word in small groups, in, in individually, and in, and in the larger body of, of the church. So here it is again. To experience joy produced by the Holy Spirit while we study the Bible. God's Word. That's what we're going to root joy in. That's a pretty big statement to say, yeah, we're, we just, joy. It's about the Holy Spirit in the Bible. There's a lot in there. And so today we're going to unpack that a little bit. Uh, but in order to do this, in order for, if I'm going to sit up here and say that the joy that we have in the church is rooted deeply in the study of the Bible and the way the Holy Spirit works on us, I had better tell you a little bit about the Bible, right? And my, my guess is today that you don't know as much about the Bible as 
you probably ought to in order to say, yes, I stand on that Bible, it is the whole truth and everything, and I'll put my hand on it and I'll say this and this, and it's the Bible. It's holy. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know as Christians about the Bible. And I would say we're in a generation of biblically illiterate people. We don't know what's in it. We don't know the stories. We don't know the people. We don't know if it's in the, this part of the book or this part of the book. And, and so today, before we do anything, I want to talk about how the Bible came to be and kind of what it contains. So first, the word Bible is a Greek word. Does anybody know what the Greek word biblos means? Since I can't hear you, if you said a good answer, thank you. Uh, <laughs> biblos really means little books. Little books. Does anybody know how many little books are in the Bible? Just yell it out if you do. There it is. 66 books. If you're Catholic, we'll talk about this in a minute. Or previously. Um, there are 66 books in the Biblos. All right? Now, these books are divided into two sections. One is the Old Testament. Now, does anybody know what the other one is? Yeah, yeah. This is great. I love when you participate. Um, in order to have a New Testament, you must have an Old Testament. Otherwise, the New Testament is simply a testament, right? Testament means promise. It means covenant. It means, uh, it's, like, it's like a contractual agreement between God and people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But all the books, all the little books that are comprised, the 66 books that we say are the Bible, were written over a very long period of time. A person actually wrote, down, wrote all these books. God didn't have like a floating pen. And it was like, mm, and then wrote the Bible. Um, I know that's kind of silly to say, but some people are like, yeah, no, that's probably what happened. No, what happened is people wrote on parchment or papyrus, like leaves or goat skin, and they would, in, into scrolls, and then they turned into books. And all the original documents that we base our Bible on were written somewhere in between the year 1200 B, C, E, there are not dinosaurs, but they were close, all right? Dinosaurs are somewhere over here, all right? It's B, C, E, and then zero, and in between here, all the books in the Old Testament, New Testament, this is common era, 150. That's a long time, isn't it? That's a long time to say, yeah, all those books, 66, were written over that amount of time. Now, to put this in perspective... This is a fantastic year, 1984. This is when Kirby Puckett and Michael Jordan were rookies and Jeremiah Ledeen was born. This is an important, important year, okay? Uh, as Stephanie Peterson reminded me, it is also the year that the NIV kind of got rolling. Uh, NIV is an, uh, uh, the kind of Bible we use here, the translation we use here. But just to say right here, just to put it in perspective, how long of a period of time? Also this. This right here is the life of Jesus. The new promise is Jesus. And we'll get to that. But his life, just a little bit longer than mine so far, um, was he was born somewhere around 1 to 3 and died somewhere between 30 and 33. All the books in the Old Testament, the last one was probably written, we think, somewhere around 250. So we get all the books over here. Now, how many, anybody know how many are in the Old Testament? What's up? 39. 
And if you do math, you should be able to figure this one out, even if you don't. 27, I'll figure it out for you. 27 in the New Testament. 39 books composed from here to here. Not just about things that happened between here and here, but about things that happened between here and over here, somewhere around 2,500. All written about here. And then the New Testament, those books composed starting somewhere in the year about 50. And they're done being composed in 100 years. Right here. By the year 150. Second Peter and Jude uh, are probably written right around 150. And maybe the book of Acts. We're not sure yet. Um, so there it is. Kind of a timeline. One more date to put on here. When I refer to, and this will get to uh, some of those of you who were once Catholic or still are or recovering or transitioning. I don't know. Um, in the year, in the 15th, in the 16th century, there was this thing called the Reformation. That might not be to scale. Um, and, and a bunch of guys who drank too much beer, rooted in their basements, said, you know what, Catholic Church? Mm, we got to spread it out here. Everybody's got to be able to read the Bible. And, uh, and when that happened, when that happened, the Catholic Church split and the Protestants, that's what we are as Methodists, we are Protestants, and Lutherans, I mean, and Presbyterians, you name it, we split here. And from this point forward, we use a Bible that has 66 books in it. So when I refer to the Protestant, when I refer to the Bible, I'm referring to the Protestant Bible, which has 66 books. Now, there are some books composed in between here, 250 and 0, that the Catholic uh, church in some of the Eastern Orthodox churches say, yep, we like those books too. I think there's 14 of them. They're called the Apocrypha. And so they keep those in addition to the 66. Um, Protestants said, no, we're good with that. Uh, we got what we need. So we're going to go with 66. And so that's what happens. So when I refer to the Bible, that's what I'm talking about. The 66 Protestant, uh, the book that was formed in the 15, in 1500. Now, just to make a distinction. We're going to go Old Testament and then New Testament. Just to kind of give you an idea of what the Bible is made of. Because maybe you don't know. The only time you look at the contents is to figure out and you look at it really slowly. So that nobody sees that you don't know which book you're going to. Like, no, he's definitely on page one looking at the contents. Trying to find where Matthew starts. All right? Now, I've done that. It's me totally. But just in case you haven't looked, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the Hebrew Bible is different than... The Old Testament. Christians call it the Old Testament, as I said before, because Christians believe there is another one, which is newer. Um, sometimes Christians will refer to this as the First Testament, so as not to offend people, as if being old was a bad thing. Uh, but it's not. Being old's good, if you feel like you're old. All right? Um, the Hebrew Bible is specifically, is, is what the Jewish people today would follow. Now, does anybody know what language the Hebrew Bible is written in? Hebrew. Good job if you said that. This here in Hebrew, this is the name for God in Hebrew, and it is read from right to left. Whoa, right? That's crazy. And there's no vowels there yet. Vowels look something like that, right? Now you're confused. So, written in Hebrew, the Old Testament. The New Testament written in Greek. Thank you. Um, see if I remember how to do it. I'm thinking this here there it was. Jesus Christ, read from, thank you, we're back to normal, left to right. This is our Bible basics. Now, let's talk a little bit about the differences here between the Hebrew Bible, Jews believe it to be, and what Christians call the Old Testament. Things to remember, the Hebrew Bible 
and the Old Testament agree on this. There are 39 books. They don't change. Same books. But what changes is their order, the way that they're composed. And the order is really important. We'll talk about this in a little bit. They end differently because of what they're trying to do to the person who reads them and the people who subscribe to those books. So we've got the Hebrew Bible. And it's also called something you may have heard before, the Tanakh. Now, those are big letters. I don't write like that. that that's, for, that's for this illustration, okay? I don't really write like this. Uh, every other letter isn't like that. Um, it's divi divided up into three sections, the Hebrew Bible. There's the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, known as the Law. If you hear that and see that in the, in the, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, they're referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then you move into something called the Nevi'im, which is Hebrew for prophets. Now prophets, we're going to talk about one later named Hosea. Um, prophets do God's dirty work. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the third section is called the Ketuvim, which are the writings. Now this is stuff like the Psalms, this is Proverbs, this is, this is like Song of Songs. I mean, it's that sort of stuff fallen there. This composes this order makes up the 39 for the Hebrew Bible and Jews as we know it today. Now, as Christians, we mixed it up a little bit. Somewhere in the year 300 to 400, some guys, and I say guys because it was, it, was it was a bunch of men, got together and said, we're going to order this in a way that sets us up for the New Testament. And so what happened is they ordered it like this. They're like, yeah, Torah. We like the Torah where it is. I mean, it starts within the beginning, so let's put it at the front, right? So you got the Torah, and then you've got history books, like Joshua, right, talking in, in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. We got the history books. That kind of fits in here, too. Um, and then we've got something called the wisdom literature. We add a fourth one. There are four parts here. We had the fourth one, wisdom literature, and then the last one is prophets. Now, if you notice, this is the distinction I want you to get so far as the difference between these two, is that the prophets right here, Nevi'im, that means prophets, are in the middle for the Hebrew Bible and for Hebrew and Jewish people. For the Christians, the prophets, the people who go out and proclaim what's coming next, look out, this is going to happen. Or, good job, you're doing well, but if you don't keep doing well, this is what's going to happen. That's usually the message. Christians put it at the very end. Because what follows the end of this? That one, right? That's, that's the way that it works here. And so, the difference is this. To be as short as I can, the Hebrew Bible ends with the book 2 Chronicles. Now, if you know anything about the, about the, about the Hebrew story, they're in Egypt. They get led through, they get broken out of slavery, they're led through the wilderness, they come to a promised land, and God says, you are my people, I love you. Here's some land, right? That's fantastic. Land is a big deal, and having kids is a big deal. And God says, you will have many kids, and you will have land, because I love you, you are chosen by me. What happens in the year, somewhere, I think it's like 371, or the temple falls in 722. The first temple falls. They no longer have their... No, it's 587. Sorry. 587. If, if, whatever. 587 is when the temple falls. 722 is when the kingdom splits. And the temple falls in 587, and then they're spread out. Their land that they were promised is gone. And the fact that they're dying, and they're not able to reproduce and have all the kids they want and, and live out their family... If you hear this as a, as, a, as a Jewish person in that day, you would suggest, based on what God has said is the covenant, the promise, you are loved and, and you are my people, here's some land. If, you, if all this is happening, you're going to say, yeah, I don't think God's legitimate anymore. He is forsaking us. If he is legitimate, if he is real, he's turned his back on us. And so that happens in 587, and then somewhere in 300, I think it's three. I can't raise my left hand. 370-something. Um, 
the Persians. Anybody seen the movie 300? The, the big tall guy with the big hoop earrings. He stands up. Cyrus is his name. He comes and he conquers the Babylonians who were just oppressing the Jewish people. And the, Cyrus comes and he says, Jewish people, you can go home. He's like, what? We can go, we can like go to our, where we were before, you know, 200 plus years ago. Yeah, you can go home and you can have it. And so they go home and they start, that is where, that is where 2 Chronicles ends. It ends with this idea that you're going home, Jewish people. God still cares about you. He still loves you. He's giving you back what once was taken from you. And so it ends with this idea that no matter what happens, Jewish people, God will provide for you. That the promise doesn't end. It's a pretty good ending, right? Christians would say, yeah, we're on board. We actually like that. I like it. It's good. But Christians do something different. Around 300, 400, Christians do something different, and they put the prophets at the end, and they have a prophet named Malachi. Now remember, prophets say what's coming next. And for Christians, it's not done yet. It is not done. The fact that we're on our way back to our land, that's not it. That is not the promise. It's part of it, but it's something different. A new temple, that's not what Christians are looking for. What they're looking for is a guy who says, I will tear down your temple, Jesus Christ. I will tear down your temple and rebuild it in three days. He is the new temple. He is the new promise. So Christians end with this guy named Malachi in the Old Testament who says basically this. A guy is going to come who's going to lead the way, prepare the way for the new promise, for the Messiah. That guy is John the Baptist. He is the guy who says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus comes, and he does it. And so Christians, strategically, after many, it, you know, books are done, written, right? Here, 200 plus years later, are building this to, to make a coherent statement that this is very valid. Never call it old if, you mean, if by old you mean never useful anymore. Because it is everything that it needs to be in order that this will make sense. And so we get over here to the New Testament and we've got a whole bunch of different stories. We've got what we call the Gospels. Gospels mean good news. Good news. The good news according to John. The good news according to Matthew, right? The Gospel of Matthew. That's what it means. And there are many good news is out there, right? Like there is a good news according to Jeremiah. It is my testimony. It is what I share with you now, my testimony about Jesus Christ, the good news according to Jeremiah, the good news according to you. You have one. You have a gospel. And so we have four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that make up the New Testament. And then following, keep in mind these are strategically placed in this order, not based on when they were written. We've got following this some history, the book of Acts tells about the early church history. Anytime someone goes, yeah, we just need to be the Acts 2 church. We just need to sit around and, you know, eat food together and share lawnmowers and stuff, right? Like, that is, that's the Acts 2 church. That's what they're talking about because this is the history that we're getting at. And then we also, in the New Testament, I don't know if you're seeing a pattern here yet, we have writings. Writings. Paul writes letters to communities like us. Hey, good job. Way to do what you do. Way to do the, you know, Friday food giveaway. Big high five on that crossroads. Like, that's what, that's what Paul is doing. Or he's saying, oh, you know what, you you're actually should be doing this and you're doing this wrong. And quit arguing about stupid things and let women sit in the front and whatever. I don't know what it is. That's what Paul is doing. He's writing letters to people. And so we have, com we, we have these three. And then there's one other one we have, which is called apocalyptic stuff. Um, or Revelation. Now, when I say Revelation, you think of the last book of the Bible, but really 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are all Revelation, apocalyptic literature. There is a ridiculous parallel here. I don't know if you see it, but by the way that Christians organize the Old Testament and the New Testament right around this time, you see you've got Gospels. You've got major people. Abraham, Moses, Noah, big people, the fathers of the faith. Over here, you've got major people for Christians. Jesus is the major guy, 
right? He is the guy that we're talking about. So he is our guy. Now you go back over here and you've got history, the history of the Jewish people. You've got the history of the early Christian church. And then you come back over here and you've got writings like poems. You've got Song of Songs. You've got the Book of Lamentations, which is like a giant journal entry on the guy's worst day of his life. You've got writings, and that's what Paul does. He writes that stuff. Paul writes from prison all the time. And then you've got apocalyptic literature. You've got, I mean, we we order it with prophets. Here's what's coming. Um, There's one apocalyptic book in the Old Testament that's called Daniel. Um, It was probably one of the last books written. All apocalyptic literature, for the most part, was written sometime in this period right here. And so Daniel comes right in here. And Revelation comes somewhere in this area too. But you see the parallel here that they weren't messing around. They had an idea. They had an idea. But it's not chronological. There is only... there. Okay. The temple falls in 587, the first temple. It falls again in 66-ish. Somewhere in here. And when that temple falls, we have half of our books in the New Testament written on this side and about half of them written on this side. One gospel is written on the other side before the temple falls. And the other side, uh, after the temple falls, we get just about, we get all three of the other gospels. Our first book that was probably written in the New Testament is 1 Thessalonians, written by the Apostle Paul, written somewhere in the year 50, about 16-ish years after Jesus dies. And the last book, like we said before, was written somewhere around 150, probably 2 Peter and Jude, and maybe Acts. Now, the whole point of this is to confuse you a little bit, uh, but also this. It's important to know that all the, 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 the manuscripts that we build our Bible off of, right, that as we have it today, The actual documents that we use, we have no original documents between this period at all. Not one of the originals exists in, as, I mean, if if we have it, it's buried somewhere. We don't know where it is. All we have are copies. We have copies of the originals. Now, this is cool, right? Copies are good. Um, The issue is, the earliest copy we have of anything from the New Testament specifically is right around the year, like a full copy, is the year 200. And if the last book was written somewhere around 150, most of them written in between, you know, 60-ish, 50 to 100, it's pretty old stuff. And people are literally writing them down. They have giant scrolls and they're called scribes. They're the people who could read and write, and they'll write this down. And then, could you imagine this? I mean, I don't know if you can imagine this. Someone has a conviction like, oh, I don't think it matters what kind of, you know, how we sew things together anymore. I'm going to change that. And that happened. Stuff like that happened. Now, for the most part, um, they're pretty true to the text. Now, there are some instances, specifically in the New Testament, um, where, like, in, in the Gospel, no, in First John, There's a part where the only place in the Bible where it says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like links the three, the Trinity, right? The only place um, we believe was added. It was added to the first John somewhere. The latest manuscript we have was in the year 1400. So usually when when we look for like what is the most accurate, we go what is the oldest and what is the shortest. That's kind of the way that people... The, the, the people with the big brains do it. They say if it's shorter and it's older, it's probably the most original copy. But we don't have any real original copies. We only, or we don't have original manuscripts. We only have copies of them. Now, in the year 1943 or 47, there was something called the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. It was a pretty big deal. Because that brought our stuff back all the way. We had documents all the way dating back to the year 250. That's how old they were. But because these documents were written somewhere around here, we still didn't have any originals. So we've got Old Testament documents, 200 of them, fragments. Like these aren't like, 
this isn't like a book and you like flip through it, right? This is, this is a scroll and it's huge. And it takes like two people to carry these around sometimes. And they're just gigantic because they contain all this stuff on there. And there's no, like these vowels are important. It'd be like me writing this word without vowels because they didn't have vowels in their writings. They only had consonants. So you have to figure out what that word is based on that. And so somewhere around the year 700 to uh, 100, a bunch of Jewish people got together and said, yeah, we're going to add the vowels in there. And that is today, it's called the Masoretic Text, that is today what the, Israel, the, the Jewish people use as their Hebrew Bible. Now, they probably incorporate some of the, the 200 Dead Sea Scroll ones that date back to here. Um, but for the most part, the Masoretic Text is the real deal for them. Um, and for the New Testament, we also have no, no original copies, but we have, get ready for it, 5,000 different uh, manuscripts that are just copies of the originals. 5,000. Could you imagine piecing through that? No thanks. Not a job for me. And what's interesting about this is that the oldest full one we have is to the year 200, which is still 80, just about 80 years, 50 to 80 years from the last written book. We have a fragment from the Gospel of John. One fragment, probably literally about this big, front and back, containing maybe what would equal a total of maybe equal a total of four verses, but front and back, so they don't connect to each other, right? They date back to the year 125. Wow. We're still not even there yet. And I think what's really unique about this is that people today, and this isn't even the whole story, because my whiteboard isn't big enough, but... What's really interesting about this is that in all its complexities and all the fact that all the gaps, the fact that we don't have everything we need, people will stand up who probably have never read it and say, this is how I base my life on everything written in here. I haven't read it, but I mean, I probably do everything that's in it. Right? Like, oh, you can't get married to you because of this, because of this mess. Or you can't kill people because of this. Or this is what abortion means. We, people say, yeah, no, it says it right in here. It addresses all these issues. You know, can you imagine the kind of society, cultural shifts from 1200 to 33, conquered over and over again by different people? You can't be, and I'm not making a statement that this, this is right or this is wrong or these people should get married and these people shouldn't, but I'm saying you need to be careful when you say that stuff because you don't really know what's in here. I really don't know what's in here. And now, joy? Where's the joy in this? Crossroads Church says, we experience joy Produced by the Holy Spirit when studying God's Word. And this is what Christians believe is God's Word. Is there joy in this? It seems like a giant mess to me. It seems like a huge mess. Like how can this dictate anything that I do in my life? A smart guy, a pastor in Minnesota, well known, I won't say his name in case you don't like him. Um, he said this, that... He doesn't believe in Jesus because of the Bible. He believes in the Bible because of Jesus. If you're sitting there going, I need to get this right. I need to make this algebra problem make sense. And at the bottom of the next 52 whiteboards, I need to have an explanation of why each book in each year makes sense so that I can believe this and hold it to be true. If that's your personality, I'm going to tell you right now, you will never prove that God exists by that method. Because that is not what Christians operate on. We do not operate on some sort of mathematical equation that makes all 66 of these books and 14 other ones that maybe we do or don't like 
We do not exist on a way that says, yep, we got to add these up and it's got to come out a perfect sum. You will not find the new promise if that's the way. You will not find the new promise in Jesus Christ if you are trying to read the Bible like that. Instead, our core value says, we experience joy produced by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now this is a thing that's been in and out and we believe has been driving the whole production of Scripture all the way until 2013 when we got it right here in our hands. The Holy Spirit is driving everything to say, yeah, that's why we can believe this. The Holy Spirit was there when the prophets were doing their thing. In fact, one prophet named Hosea, he changed his whole identity he changed his whole identity because of the Holy Spirit, that thing that compelled him. Hosea is told to go to the northern kingdom that split in 722, not 587, and Israel and Judah and God, like I said, prophets do God's dirty work. And so what happens is God says, hey, Hosea, I need you to go there and tell them that they're bad. It's like, hey, no problem. That's what prophets do. I'll do this. And the way prophets usually do it was with their mouth. They just talk. They stand up and do what I'm doing without it's such a nice shirt. And they say things like, you're doing it wrong. And they say, we don't care or we're going to change. But God says, you know what, Hosea, you have to do it differently. You have to go tell the people who I say, you are my beloved and you are my people. You have to tell them like this. See a woman right there? Her name is Gomer. Anybody named Gomer in here? All right. That name's done. Thank the Lord. Uh, Gomer, it, Gomer was what? What does the Bible say Gomer was? A promiscuous woman. Yes, a prostitute. If she gets paid, she's a prostitute, right? God says, go marry Gomer, Hosea, because she's going to cheat on you. God, go, Hosea, could you imagine? Not a lot of joy, right? Not a lot of, of that picture that we had at the beginning. And he's like, all right, well, I'll do it. I'll do it. So he marries her. And then he has three kids, and the second kid he names Lo. Ruhama, which means you are not loved. And his third kid, he names Lo Ami, which means you are not my people. If you are the Hebrew people and someone shows up and says, hey guys, my name is Hosea, there's my wife Gomer. Yeah, she's cheating on me. That's because she is unfaithful to me like you are unfaithful to God. And also there goes my kid Lo Ruhama and Lo Ami to tell you that God is saying you are not my people and you are not loved anymore because of the way you're acting. Now you can focus, you can focus on the message, but what I want you to get right here is this, that Hosea changed his entire identity and everything that he was because of something that compelled him deep within. It stirred inside of him. He did not have a book called the Nevi'im about prophets. He didn't have that. He was one, right? He didn't have this, but he had something, and we call it the Holy Spirit, stirring in him, compelling him to do what he does. And we believe today, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that if we are out of our mind, if we are crazy, it is because Christ's love compels us. It is because an event that actually happened, not a book, but an event that happened in the year 30 to 33 has significant impact on the way you do and live your life today. The way you sit in this the chair and the way you leave and the sort of conversations you have as you go. Be compelled this day by the Holy Spirit. Because there is hope. You will not convince yourself this is right, but when the Holy Spirit comes, it will draw you to this scripture and it will tell you that, hey, you need to just read it. On Monday nights right now, I get together with a group of anywhere between 5 to 20 people and we read one whole book of the Bible. We eat food and then we read a whole book of the Bible. Have you ever watched a movie? Two hours to watch a movie? It takes about two hours to read 30 chapters in the Bible with a group of eight people. If I asked you to watch the movie Goodwill Hunting and you said, yeah, I've seen the scene on the bench, so that means I've seen the movie. No, you haven't. You haven't. If you've read 10 chapters in a book, have you read the Bible? No, you haven't. I encourage you, find five people this week. Get some Bibles. If you need some Bibles, come talk to me. I have like 70 of them. I will give them to you, and you can sit down in a circle 
and read this word because it's not going to get any less confusing if you don't open it up and allow the Holy Spirit to do something fantastic. And that is where we find our joy. That is our core value. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.